regularly scheduled meeting of the Community Development Committee of the Metropolitan Council. Uh, I'm Chair Robert Lilligren. We're joined by a quorum of the committee. Councilmember Alice Ingervitson will not be joining us today. Council members, we have an agenda before us. I will entertain a motion to approve. Move approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion, additions, changes? Seeing none, all in approval. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Council members, we have uh, approval of the minutes of the September 16, 2019 regular meeting of the Community Development Committee. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank Second. You. Thank you. Any discussions, additions, or corrections? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you. We'll move on to our business items. Uh, the first is item 2019-264. It is a joint committee's item. It's the City of Shakopee 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan Review. Ms. Smiley, welcome. Hello. Um, hi, uh, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Um, my name is uh, Ryan Smiley. I'm the sector representative for uh, District 4 in the LPA for Local Planning Assistance and Community Development. Uh, I would also like to let the committee know that uh, Joe Whiting, senior planner with the city of Shakopee, is here in the audience. And um, I should thank Joe for his hard work in collaborating uh, this whole effort and um, getting this plan to where it is right now. Great. Thank you, Mr. Whiting. Thanks for being here and thanks for your work. Uh, so before you today is the review of the city of Shakopee's 2040 comprehensive plan update. Uh, so this map shows the location of regional systems, uh, regional system components within the city of Shakopee. The system plan components uh, within the city include a few highways, including Highway 169, um, a couple of RBTN uh, Tier 1 and Tier 2 corridors and alignments. Um, it is within the, the city of Shakopee is within the influence area of the Flying Cloud um, Airport in the city of Eden Prairie. Um, there are if also uh, a few uh, Metropolitan Council um, interceptors, lift stations, and meters. Um, and some of the uh, park features within the city are the landing, special recreation feature, Scott County Regional Trail, Minnesota River Extension Regional Trail Search Corridor, Louisville Regional Trail Search Corridor, and Prior Lake Outlet Regional Trail Search Corridor. There are quite a few pieces in there. Um, Thrive MSP 2040 has designated the city of Shakopee as suburban edge communities, and Shakopee is located in northern Scott County, kind of above the Minnesota River. Uh, it is surrounded by the communities of Chanhassen, Eden Prairie, Bloomington, Savage, Prior Lake, Sand Creek Township, Louisville Township, and Jackson Township. Table one, also in your staff report, uh, shows the forecasted growth between uh, 2020 and 2040. The council and the city have agreed on a forecast revision that is also shown on this table under the revised forecast. Uh, so the council forecasts that the city uh, with this revision will grow by uh, 14,800 people representing 5,800 households. And there will be an increase of 7,100 jobs uh, within this, in the city within this time period. This is a table two from the staff report. Um, it illustrates the planned residential density in the suburban edge areas of the city. The overall density for guided residential land is expected uh, to be, as you can see in this table, between uh, 6.37 and about 15 and a half units an acre. So communities that are designated as suburban edge communities by Thrive MSB 2040 are expected to plan for forecasted population uh, and household growth at overall average densities of at least three to five units an acre. Um, so the Shakopee's plan is consistent with this policy for develop new development and redevelopment. Um, the cities, uh, before you is the city's existing land use map. Uh, it refers to figure three in your staff report as well. About 26% um, of the current land uses within the city is residential, and that is followed by 20% of parks and open space, actually. Um, here before you is a 2040 planned land use map of the city. 
Um, it is also figure four of your staff report. Um, and as shown on this map, areas uh, with the hatched overlay, um, you can see it from there. Um, these are properties that are in fee or trust that belong to the Shakopee Midewakan Sioux community or SMSC. These properties indicate a substantial amount of land within the boundary of the city. Um, any land that um, is identified in this map um, as SMSC land, the city does not have any land use authority over them. And um, as a side note, uh, the forecasted population that I mentioned uh, prior to this, uh, both population and households and job increases, they exclude uh, SMSC land in, uh, from the analysis. Uh, is the same, um, the same analysis is true for land use uh, calculation. So the SMSC land and that land supply is not uh, included in, the, uh, in our forecast and land use analysis. Um, the areas highlighted on the map is, oh wait, oh, sorry, I forgot that I had that animation in there. <laughs> there we go. Areas highlighted on the map is, this is land within Jackson Township. Uh, this is uh, an area that has an orderly annexation agreement with the city of Shakopee. Uh, the OEA was originally created in 2002 and it was amended in 2018 or updated in 2018. The township encompasses about 4,000 acres. And this map that is also included is part of the, the plan itself and is included in the staff report as figure five. Uh, it shows the eligib eligibility excuse me, and staging of uh, annexation between the township and the city. So not a all areas are eligible for annexation at the same time. And areas that are identified as E and F kind of on the, um, on the bottom, uh, these are not eligible to be annexed until after 2040. Uh, so because they're not going to be annexed uh, until after 2040, they're, they were not included in our uh, density and land use analysis either. I do want to say that it is noteworthy to mention that the City of Shakopee's Envision Shakopee 2040 Comprehensive Plan was the 2019 recipient of the Planning and Context Award from the American Planning Association Minnesota mm -hmm. Chapter just very recently. This award fo focuses on tailoring a plan within a given context while going above and beyond in developing a sensible plan and demonstrating careful study. So I want to congratulate um, the city and the city staff for this very well-deserved recognition. Okay, so um, the proposed findings are that the plan conforms to the Metropolitan System Plans, is consistent with council policies, with the proposed forecast changes, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. Um, and as you can see, on Tuesday, September 24th, the Environmental Services uh, staff presented this plan to the Environment Committee, so it went to the Environment Committee first. Uh, this will be on the Metropolitan Council agenda at the um, meeting on October 23rd. Uh, and I do want to just uh, remind the committee that uh, Joe Whiting from the City of Shakopee is in uh, the audience. With that, the proposed action uh, in front of you is to authorize the city of Shakopee to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect, uh, to revise the city's forecast upward as shown in table one of the review record, revise the city's allocation of affordable housing need to 975 units, and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for surface water management and land use. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, committee members, any questions for Mrs. Smiley? Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you tell me what uh, considerations there are for orderly annexation? Mrs. Smiley. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Cummings. Um, with, with orderly annexation agreements, uh, what we typically look for is to make sure that the agreement is valid for the duration of the planning process. So this planning process going up all the way to 2040, um, making sure that that agreement is, um, is still in place, whether or not the land is fully annexed uh, by 2040 uh, within the city, but also depending on um, the terms of the agreement, the land may or may not be considered uh, 
as a viable land supply towards the analysis of the density and land use for um, for our internal uh, land use analyses. Uh, so in this case, um, as it was noted by the city, there are areas that they have identified ineligible for annexation up to a certain time. So we didn't consider those, but in some other cases, we um, may need to make that determination ourselves. Um, Lisa, do you want to add anything that I may have forgotten? Um, Mr. Chair, House Director members, Barano. thank you. I would just add that um, the communities who use annexation as a method for increasing their land supply to support their growth, um, we support um, orderly annexation as a method to do that. It's planful. It helps us ensure that we have appropriate uh, wastewater capacity available. We know when land's going to come in. Uh, obviously, it might be slower given market conditions. Um, there are cases we know um, communities, cities have the ability to annex by ordinance and do smaller parcels and piecemeal of that. Um, and those sometimes can get caught up in disputes. So um, agreements with townships are the preferred approach that we would recommend. And it's nice to see them in plans as well. And so we look for that in order to count land supply. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Councilmember Lee. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, mine was a follow up to that too. How often do cities and townships an annex each other? And what are the, the other political or logistical considerations why they would do that? Thank you. Ms. Smiley. Um, Mr. Chair, Council, Council Member Lee, um, in some cases, uh, such as the case for the city of Shakopee and Jackson Township, uh, there is an orderly annexation agreement, meaning that the township and the city have come to the table uh, with the county presence, probably, uh, to, um, to figure out and facilitate a discussion and talk, talking about uh, the future growth of the city and annexing the areas and incorporating areas of the township. Um, that are unincorporated. Uh, in some other cases, as uh, Lisa mentioned, uh, it may be by uh, annexation by ordinance. So it would be a petition for from a landowner that would come in and um, request to be annexed into the city, and that will follow a local process of um, going to the council and voting on it, and um, just making that annexation happen. Um, usually. I mean, there. I, I believe there are cases that can potentially be um, politically sensitive. Uh, that uh, some landowner, some landowners may or may not want to be considered as part of an orderly annexation area. They may want to remain within a township, and um, and therefore the the township may not be able to reach that agreement ahead of time. Um, that being said, the annexation by ordinance is always on the table and the, the township and the property owners can always come forth with uh, that agreement. In some cases, there's also, um, and that's something that is also laid out in an annexation agreement if there is one, uh, that there may be uh, some explanation of any fees exchanged between the township and the city for that annexation. Um, so I would say, I guess short answer is that there, it kind of depends in some cases. Um, in most cases, there aren't any issues, uh, but that doesn't mean that every single township has an orderly annexation with a neighboring city. Thanks. Thank you. Further questions on this report? Further questions? Seeing none, Mr. Whiting, thanks again for being here. Please carry your thanks back uh, to the city of Shakopee with congratulations for what sounds like a very well-deserved award. Uh, but entertain a motion to have, oh, Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as the other council member <laughs> from Scott County, I will move approval of this item. Thank you, council member. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. And. Mrs. Small, you have the next item too. Item two is 2019-265. It's a joint committee's item as well. It's the City of Adnes Heights 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer. Mrs. Small. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Um, I don't think I need to introduce myself again. Um, and before you today is the City of Adnes Heights 2040 Comprehensive Plan update. 
Uh, this map shows the location of the regional systems within the city of Madness Heights. Um, there are a few components such as the highways um, I-35E and um, I-694 that are within uh, the city of uh, Vadnais Heights. There's also uh, Rush Line has a station within the uh, city of Vadnais Heights, but this is part of the increased revenue scenario. Um, uh, a few uh, Tier 1 and Tier 2 RBTN alignments and corridors, um, Metropolitan Council, Environmental Services, meters, lift station, and interceptors, as well as, well as Vadnais Snail Lake Regional Park, Highway 96 Regional Trail, Trout Brook Extension Regional Trail Search Corridor. So these are a few other components of our regional system within the city of Atlas Heights. Um, Thrive MSP 2040 has uh, designated the city as suburban and um, the city of Atlas Heights is surrounded by the communities of North Oaks, White Bear Township, White Bear Lake, Gem Lake, Maplewood, Little Canada, and Shoreview. Table one, which is also a part of your staff report, uh, shows that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts that the city will grow by 900 people, representing about 600 households. And there will also be an increase of 2,300 jobs in the city in the same time frame. Um, table two from the staff report shown here, um, it illustrates the planned residential density in the suburban areas of the city. The overall density for guided residential land, as shown in this table, is between 5.7 and 12.9 units an acre. So communities that are designated as suburban under Thrive MSB 2040 are expected to develop um, at, uh, or plan for average uh, densities of um, at least five units an acre, and that's where new development and redevelopment and Badness Heights is consistent with that policy. The city's existing land use map refers to figure three of your staff report, and um, the city is mostly uh, residential. It's about 33% residential land uses, and it's followed by about 28% in parks and open space and water. The city's future land use is the figure four of your staff report. Um, as it's shown on this map, there's a concentration of industrial and some uh, commercial land uses um, east of Highway 35E. Uh, most of the rest of the city pretty much remains residential um, with some higher density residential land uses around major transportation corridors. Uh, the areas that I'm not quite sure if you can see that easily. Uh, they have a dash blue line around them. These are areas that are identified for future uh, development and redevelopment. So that's where uh, most of the focus of the plan was um, concentrated. Uh, the plan rush line BRT station as part of the increased revenue scenario is located at County Road um, E or Highway 61. The land uses planned for development and redevelopment within the half mile of the station area include highway commercial, industrial, and public and institutional. So the proposed finding is that the plan conforms to metropolitan system plans, is consistent with council policies, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. Um, Similar to the City of Shakopee's plan, uh, this plan has been to the Environment Committee. At, it was presented to the Environment Committee uh, by Environmental Services staff on September 24th, and it's scheduled to go uh, to the Metropolitan Council at their meeting on October 23rd. Um, and so the proposed action before you, sorry, is to authorize the City of Vatness Heights to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for transportation and surface water management. With that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions on that report from Mrs. Smiley? Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is sort of inside baseball, but um, noticing the change between having the wetland areas as undeveloped and now it's which to sort of an overlay splotchy thing on the the future land use map are they using the wetland as part of the area a 
have ownership for new development or are they in separate out is the are the wetlands in separate outlines Ms. this um mr chair council member wolf um i don't remember in terms of their platting um practices whether or not wetlands are separate outlots uh, but it certainly is not a separate land use category. So for uh, density calculation, wetlands are not considered, uh, I mean, we take that out. So um, for net density calculations, uh, wetlands aren't included. And um, the between the two maps, I do want to say that um, it is undeveloped, but that's only because it's this is the existing land use. Their hope is for it to be more residential and they may, um, I, I'm quite, not quite sure whether or not they would put the wetlands as a separate outlet or they would consider it as part of the plat itself. Yeah, either way, it would not count towards the density. Okay. Um, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Further questions? Ms. Osmani, is there anyone from the city of Adnes Heights here tonight? I just know we have so many visitors. We'll check. Thanks. No. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Smiley has proposed uh, action on the City of Adnes Heights 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Is there a motion? Council Member Bento. I move approval. Great. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? Mr. Chair. Yeah, please, Council Mr. Member Chair, if, if Thank you. If I could, um, uh, Adnes Heights is a really interesting community. One of the things that I do before I go out to visit um, communities and townships in the district is look up their history online and as far as I've learned so far it's all been truthful it hasn't been made up stuff <laughs> so you never know what you're going to find but Vadness Heights like so many communities in the metro area has a really long rich history and it when I went to meet with them they gave me a book which is in the library here now about their history it's it's a beautifully um beautifully written book full of photographs and, and stories about the first settlers in that area. And I, I just want to commend the city for really good work in terms of, of taking uh, a unique part of our metro area and making it a special community for the people who live there. Please, thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you very much for your work. Yeah. Uh, business item three is 2019-271, another joint committee's item. It's the City of Lake Elmo 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. And Ms. Wendo, welcome. Hello, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Uh, my name is Corinne Wendell, the Sector Representative for Districts 11 and 12. And before you today is the 2040 Comprehensive Plan for the City of Lake Elmo. Uh, I'd like to let the committee know that we have Ken Roberts, the Planning Director for Lake Elmo here with us. Um, and I'd also like to commend the city for um, the great work that they've done on their plan and uh, and in partnership working with us here at the council. Great, thank you. Mr. Roberts, thanks for being here. Thanks for your work. And so here's the review of the 2040 Conference of Plan for Lake Elmo. Uh, the regional system map shown here uh, shows all of the system components within the city. Uh, Washington County is the park implementing agency for the regional park system. Uh, and their components, and that does include the uh, Lake Elmo Park Reserve. Regional trails located in the city include the Central Greenway Regional Trail, uh, also shown in Figure 1 in your staff report, and the plan also appropriately acknowledges state lands in the community, uh, including the Gateway State Trail. And so there are some principal arterials as well, uh, including Highway 94 along that southern boundary um, of the community, and then Highway 36 following the northern border um, of Lake Elmo. For their community designation, uh, Lake Elmo is located in uh, the west central of Washington County. Uh, it is surrounded by the communities of Grant, Stillwater, Stillwater Township, Oak Park Heights, Baytown Township, West Lakeland Township, Afton, Woodbury, Oakdale, and Pounding Springs. Uh, Thrive MSP 2040 has designated the city as both rural residential and as emerging suburban edge, also shown in figure two of the staff report. In terms of their forecasted growth, uh, Table 1 shows in your staff report that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts that the city will grow by about 11,280 people, uh, representing 4,400 households, and that will be an increase in about 900 jobs within that same time frame. <coughs> 
their planned residential density as shown here, uh, and also table two in the staff report. Uh, the overall density for the guided uh, residential land is expected to be between 4.21 and 7.40 units per acre. Uh, under Thrive, communities within that rural residential de uh, designation are expected to plan for rural development at densities not greater than one unit per 10 acres. And then for the emerging suburban edge, the expected planned uh, growth at the overall average net density of at least uh, three to five dwelling units per acre. And so Lake Almost plan is consistent with this policy. Shown here is the existing land use, uh, also figure three in the staff report. Uh, the city's predominantly uh, existing land uses are residential at 59%. It is followed by parks and open space at around 17% and then open water at about uh, 9%. And then approximately 5% of the city is a combination of commercial and mixed use uh, designations. And so the existing land use pattern does reflect the city's past commitment to more, a more rural landscape and the investment in development of primarily single family detached housing. Uh, rural residential neighborhoods um, with conventional rural subdivisions and open space development subdivisions <coughs> cover much of the community's landscape. And then looking ahead at their 2040 future land use map, also in figure four of your staff report, uh, the plan does stage development to accommodate forecasted growth between now and 2040. The plan also illustrates the plan staging in the 2040 land use map. Um, it shows the phasing MUSA areas uh, shown in that kind of darker, uh, thicker black dotted line uh, in those phasing areas. Um, and so the city is planning for higher density uh, throughout the community. Uh, they have different designations that will um, address that, including the high density residential, the mixed use commercial, and the village high density residential areas with the densities as high as 15 units per acre. And then growth is expected to primarily occur in those areas designated within the MUSA, um, which is consistent with council policy. And then the city geographically describes their primary uh, growth areas to the south planning area and the village planning area. So those two different planning areas uh, within both of the MUSA boundaries. And then there is adequate land to serve uh, the projected household and population and employment uh, through 2040. And then with that, the proposed findings is that the plan does conform to the Metropolitan System plans, is consistent with council policies with proposed changes, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. And for the meeting schedule, uh, Lake Elmo's 2040 plan will be seen by the Environment Committee tomorrow, October 8th, and then on to the full council on Wednesday, October 23rd. Um, I'd also like to remind the committee that Ken Roberts is here uh, from the city. Um, and with that, the proposed action is to authorize the city of Lake Elmo to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect, to revise the city's forecast upward as shown in table one and table two of the attached review record, revise the city's allocation of affordable housing need to 989 units, and advise the city to revise their TAZ allocation for 20, uh, of 2020 and 2030 employment in the plan to match the community-wide totals prior to final adoption of the plan and also the implement, uh, implementation of the advisory comments in the review record for roadways and surface water management. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wendell. Questions on that report? Any questions? Seeing none again, thanks Mr. Roberts for being here. Please thank uh, Carrier, thanks back to the City of Lake Elmo and I would enter, uh, Ms. Wendell proposed a series of actions relative to the 2040 comprehensive plan for Lake Elmo and is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Discussion on that motion? Discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Wendell. Thank you very yep. much. We'll move on to our fourth business item, 2019-272, another joint committee's item. The City of Lilydale 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Uh, and Mr. Boylan will be presenting. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Chair Lilligren. Um, and I'm Patrick Boylan. I'm the sector rep for districts 13, 14, 15, and 16 um, and local planning assistance. And um, for you, today is a review of the Lilydale Comprehensive Plan for 2040. Um, I just want the committee to know that um, Ms. Mary Schultz is the city administrator. She's in the audience today. And Mr. Phil Carlson um, with Stantec is their uh, planning uh, consultant. He's in the audience as well today. Thank you for being here. 
Just as a point of reference, um, Lilydale is um, a very small place. Um, I would imagine uh, Mary's drive here from City Hall didn't take very long. It's just across Mississippi River um, on 35E. But if you take away um, the regional park, and of course that surrounding community is City Mendota, um, and Mendota Heights, and you take away um, rather um, the uh, water, you have a very small community. You have um, approximately 0 0.87 square miles. Um, and if you remove all the acres of all the kind of non-buildable area, you have about 97 acres. Um, and just the other folks, just uh, pictures here, kind of a well-known place just off of 35E um, and Sylvia Memorial Highway or Minnesota Highway 13 um, is Enoni and Buongiorno, um, both pretty well-known Italian places. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend them. <laughs> Thank you. Now on to um, why we're here. <laughs> Regional systems before you, um, it shows the location. Again, Interstate 35E is the dominant transportation north-south, roughly north-south uh, spine. And then it's kind of hard to see, but um, the blue line on the lower left, um, that is Sibley Memorial Highway or Highway 13. Um, and then um, you also note that um, Lilydale Memorial, or sorry, Lilydale Harriet uh, Regional Park in the very, very small corner of Fort Snelling um, is in the city proper. Um, uh, there's, um, and myself, I'm an avid bicyclist and rollerblader, and I'm especially fond of the Big Rivers Regional Trail, which um, goes right through the city. Um, there's a regional sanitary sewer interceptor um, that uh, crosses the river actually um, uh, at the near 35E, just to the um, east of, of the freeway there. Community designation for the community is suburban, um, surrounded by the communities of St. Paul, Mendota Heights, and Mendota. Um, the forecasted growth, um, the underline is the proposed changes, but the um, forecasted growth uh, before you today shows a very modest growth um, of um, 60 people representing 40 households and an increase of 80 jobs in the city. Um, some discussion between uh, city administrator um, and staff here about um, some redevelopment they have um, that's in the pipeline or, um, you know, coming shortly um, and a need to that these numbers, our system statement numbers were a little low um, of what they believe to be true. Um, and given that the city we believe knows best what's on the ground, um, we take that very seriously. And so the underlying bold um, in front of you um, is are the new. So employment does not change, but there's an increase in the households and population. Again, the net growth expected between 2020 and 2040 is 60 people and 40 households. Planned residential density um, uh, that you see in the table before you from my staff report um, illustrates, um, you know, in the suburban areas, um, we expect um, these communities to plan for and grow by at least five units uh, per acre um, and more where there's regional infrastructure um, like transit. Um, this shows uh, a expected growth of 7.5 to 13.7 units per acre. Again, it's, it's hard to show this community without showing a very large portion of Mendota Heights, but the colored areas are what you need to think about. Mm -hmm. um, the existing land uses before you, um, consistent with my point earlier, uh, the majority of the city is open water or regional park and with some commercial areas uh, in red near um, 35E, uh, e, and then to the uh, east, northeast rather, is along um, Silver Memorial Highway or Highway 13. Very little difference um, for the plant future land use, except you see, you note the pink area along Highway 13. Um, that is um, the mixed use category. Um, and most recently was the River Bluff Center, which is a um, collection of buildings uh, in strip mall fashion. Um, potentially an area of redevelopment that could include uh, residential in the near future. The proposed findings in front of you, um, author of the city of Lindell, that places 2040 comp plan into effect. Um, to revise the city's forecast as mentioned upward, um, as shown in table one of the attached review record, and to revise the affordable housing need of the allocation to 18 units. Prior to their increase in households, um, they had affordable housing need of zero, um, very unusual. But again, a very small committee with um, very small amount of growth. They're representing um, additional growth, so the affordable housing need allocation does rise. Um, and then to advise the city to adopt the Mississippi River Critical Corridor Area Plan within 60 days of receiving DNR approval and submit a copy of the final adopted plan, evidence of adoption of the DNR 
Council, the National Park Service within 10 days of adoption. Just as a point of reference for the other communities you've had before you today or um, uh, this year um, in this 2040 process, um, all these communities along the Mississippi River, all from Hastings, all up to Dayton, um, need to show this. The entire city of Lilydale is within America. <laughs> So the meeting schedule is in a little over two weeks. The Environment Committee will take a look at this, and then um, early in November, um, the full body, will, this will come back, and the full body of council will take a look at this um, for our view. And just as a quick reminder, um, oh, I'm sorry, proposed action for you today is to authorize the city to put its 2040 comp plan into effect, to advise the city's forecast upwards, um, and 18 units, and advise the city to, I guess this is a double, my apologies for this, um, to adopt the market plans in 60 days. Um, just a reminder, uh, Ms. Schultz and um, Mr. Carlson are here as well. Thank you, Mr. Bullen. And Ms. Schultz, Mr. Carlson, thanks for being here. Thanks for your work on this. I'm pleased to carry the thanks back to the city of Lilydale. Any questions on the report? Questions? Seeing none, Councilmember Lee, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Yes, I have some move. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Right. Discussion on this uh, motion? Discussion. Good. Council Member Bento. Mr. Chair, I, I, I want to do a little shout out to Lilydale because so much has been made about its size, but also its proximity to the river. And a dear elderly aunt of mine spent the last three and a half years of her life at Lilydale Senior Living. It was a difficult move for her and for the family. But what was extra special about it was, even though she was no longer in her home near the Mississippi in South Minneapolis, she was in a new home near the Mississippi in Lilydale. And one of the best parts of her, her stay there was that a wonderful former mayor of Lilydale, Tom Swain, would regularly visit my aunt's memory care unit and visit with the residents there. So not only is Lilydale a special community, but they've got tremendous leaders in their community, including their former mayor, Tom Swain. So I wanted to do a special shout out to Tom. Thank you for sharing, Council Member. Pardon? Wow. 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 Impressive. Wouldn't know it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. We'll move on to our fifth business item, 2019-273, another joint committee's item. It's the City of Hugo 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan uh, with Mr. Larson. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Mike Larson, Senior Planner in Local Planning Assistance in the Community Development Division. Uh, before you now is the review of the City of Hugo's 2040 Comprehensive Plan. I don't believe we have any representatives uh, in the audience today from the City of Hugo. If that changes, I've got my back so I, to the yeah. audience, so I won't necessarily. No one's jumping up. I think. Mm -hmm. so. Thanks, Mr. Harris. All right, so this map shows the location of regional system components within the City of uh, Hugo. All wastewater generated within the city is conveyed through four council interceptors and treated at the wastewater treatment plant in St. Paul. Regional highway system elements uh, include U.S. Highway uh, 61. Regional trail system elements include the Hardwood Creek Regional Trail and the Glacial Hills Regional Trail Search Corridor. The city also appropriated, the plan rather, appropriately acknowledges state lands within the city, including the Paul Hugo Farms Wildlife Management Area. Hugo is uh, located in northwestern Washington County. Thrive MSP 2040 has designated the western portion of the city as emerging suburban edge and the eastern portion of the city as diversified rural. Communities with an emerging suburban edge designation under Thrive are expected to plan for forecasted population and household growth at average densities of at least three to five units an acre for new development and redevelopment. Communities with a diversified rural designation under Thrive are expected to plan for growth not to exceed uh, forecasts and in patterns that do not exceed four units per 40 acres. And Hugo's plan uh, is consistent with these policies. Uh, table one, also in your staff report, shows two sets of forecasts for the city of Hugo. Uh, the council's official forecasts show that between 2020 and 2040, the council expects that the city will grow by uh, uh, 12,000 people, 5,200 households, and 1,000 jobs. Uh, the city's plan does acknowledge these official forecasts of the council. 
However, the plan also includes a higher set of forecasts. This set of numbers represents the forecasts that were used in the previous 2030 comprehensive plan, but extends them uh, to the year 2040 for their current plan. Although the uh, Met Council now projects a much longer time frame to meet that level of growth, Thrive MSP 2040 states that the council will provide the necessary infrastructure to honor existing 2030 commitments for land to be included in the Metropolitan Urban Services Area by 2040. Table two from the staff report shown here illustrates the plan residential density for the urbanizing or the emerging suburban edge portion of the city. Uh, you can see here that a large percentage of acreage is guided with a minimum density of two units an acre, which uh, is less than the minimum of three units per acre for the city's community designation. Um, however, Hugo is one of 45 communities in the, re uh, in the region that participated in the plant monitoring program, which you've probably heard about a number of times. Um, this acknowledges and gives credits to community uh, for the density of actual plants that have occurred over time and it was shown here. So that is part of our policy analysis and density calculations for communities that have historically had uh, a lower, uh, uh, res low residential density. Uh, uh, policy. Uh, this approach uh, gives some credit to communities and ensures that the overall densities are uh, making uh, usually utilizing the regional wastewater treatment system uh, efficiency efficiently. Um, and you can see that uh, as part of this analysis, the city's plan is consistent with a minimum overall density of three units an acre, ranging from three to eight point four. So the city's existing land use pattern shown here and as figure three in your staff report shows the pattern of urbanization in the western portion of the city uh, on either side of Highway 61. Uh, in the eastern part of the city, agricultural and natural areas are more common. Uh, in the north, while rural, homestead, uh, rural homesteads are more prevalent in the southern portion of that area. Uh, downtown Hugo is located in this location centered around the intersection of US 61, which is known locally as Forest Boulevard, uh, and uh, with the intersection of Frenchman Road. Uh, it's, I might note that in 2013, the council supported the city's commissioning of a market study uh, to better understand the potential for the city to incorporate a mix of uses, uh, uh, reflecting the city's vision for uh, more of a mixed use downtown in our city. Uh, the city is also home, as I mentioned earlier, to the Paul. Hugo Farms Wildlife Management Area. This is a 357 area, area three, excuse me, a 357 acre area that emphasizes waterfowl management. Uh, it includes 80% wetlands, including Rice Lake, uh, with the uh, remaining area primarily as high quality maple basswood forest uh, and a 20 acre planted uh, prairie. So this slide shows the city's uh, 2040 land use plan map, which is also reflected in figure four of your staff report. Uh, continuing urbanization is shown on the western portion of the city uh, with the eastern portion uh, guided as either agriculture, uh, agricultural, excuse me, or large lot residential, both at one dwelling unit per 10 acres. Uh, acres uh, areas of the city uh, include um, Areas that are enrolled, that are enrolled in the agricultural preserves program, and in those cases, those are guided at one per forty. Uh, Hugo's downtown area along Highway sixty one and west of Egg Lake there is guided as mixed use, uh, and guiding land uses in the north of the city, which are currently undeveloped, uh, along one hundred and seventy seven, uh, excuse me, one hundred and seventy Street are not yet zoned for urban development. These areas would become available uh, for urban services in a manner consistent with the city's uh, growth management policies. <coughs> so uh, the following are staff's proposed findings for, for your review, uh, that the plan is uh, conforms to metropolitan system plans, that the plan is consistent with council policy, policies, except for housing. Uh, in the case of housing, we find that the plan is substantially consistent with housing policy. Uh, it does not address a number of things uh, that include uh, a local 4D tax program. Uh, this is a program that reduces property tax liability in exchange for maintaining affordability. Uh, another tool is partnerships with local organizations that support <coughs> the preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing. 
uh, otherwise known as NOAA, <coughs> you've probably heard. Uh, another tool is the consideration of a, uh, a local fair housing policy. Uh, this will be required for all communities that wish to participate in a livable communities program and receive grants from that program. And lastly, a uh, consideration of measures to support and protect existing manufactured, manufactured housing, which uh, the city uh, does include. Um, these are proposed and uh, these are addressed uh, in more detail in the housing section of the staff report. Uh, and they're listed in the proposed action that I will have for you momentarily. I do want to note that we've had discussions with the city if you go around these items, although we found their plan complete, we've had uh, at the time of the review, we, we've had subsequent discussions and it's their intention to engage uh, their elected officials around these remaining items. Uh, the city would like to remain a, um, a participant in the livable communities program. So I feel fairly optimistic that the city will address these items. Um, as you've probably heard um, with housing reviews, um, so a lot of communities have been, we've been working with a lot of communities to uh, button some of these issues up in the city uh, and look forward to um, continued conversations with the city uh, around around these potential tools. Um, and I also am, is not necessarily that the city needs to use all of these tools. They may not, they, they may not be appropriate, uh, but we do require uh, for a finding of consistency that the city has addressed them. Uh, finally, uh, our final finding is that uh, we found that the plan is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. Uh, this uh, plan will be before the, uh, the Environment Committee tomorrow, Tuesday, October 8th, and before the full council on the 23rd of October. So the proposed action for you today uh, is to authorize the city of Hugo to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect, uh, to strongly encourage the city to address all widely known tools in order to be <coughs> fully consistent with council housing, housing policy. Uh, the city should consider addressing in the following tools of its plan before final adoption. Uh, again, the local 4D tax program, partnerships with local NOAA preservation organizations, consideration of a fair local housing, fair ho local, sorry, consideration of a local fair housing policy, uh, and consideration of measures to support and protect existing manufactured housing. Uh, and finally, to advise the city to implement uh, the advisory committee uh, advisory comments in the review record for land use. Um, that concludes my staff report, and I'm happy to have, answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Questions on that report, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just again, back to the um, proposed findings, and just curious. So, substantially consistent with housing policy, but it does not address the 4D program, NOAA Fair Housing and Manufactured um, Support and Protection Measures. And so our recommendations are that they should consider addressing those tools and in the last two considerations. So should address with consideration. And so that's asking them to take a look um, and their willingness then to agree to do that, correct? Yeah. Um, Mr. Sure. Chair, Councilman Johnson, that is exactly <laughs> correct. And Mr. Chair, just briefly again, on the local NOAA uh, preservation organizations, so do we um, help them identify them or do they have their own organizations or how how um, how how is that captured in the discussion? Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Johnson, um, we do have a housing policy staff uh, uh, and we do have a number of resources in the local planning handbook and we will absolutely do that. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Director Barajas would like to add something. I would just say thank you, Mr. Chair, that in our staff report, too, we also identify which um, NOAA housing preservation organizations they can work with, so it's also documented as part of the record for them. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion or questions? Councilmember Vento. Um, I'd like to start by moving approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion on the report, Councilmember Thank Vento. you. Around Thank you. Um, on Saturday, the City of Hugo had their annual city tour, and I was invited to join them and was really impressed. We had a busload of about 45 to 50 people, um, city council members, the mayor, um, a state representative, councils, or, uh, council staff, city staff, um, city leaders, uh, religious leaders, community leaders, and a number of residents, including folks who had just moved to the city within the last couple weeks or the last several months. It was a really impressive tour, and the issue of affordable housing came up several times during the tour itself, as well as after the tour, there was a roundtable discussion about the needs of the city, and they realized that in order to grow, they need to meet the spectrum. So they are committed to that, and they, they mentioned it 
several times. Um, they do have over 40 Habitat for Humanity homes in Hugo. Land was donated um, by uh, a local company. And um, they also have, I believe, a Lutheran church and a Catholic church who have joined together to provide, uh, to create and provide a homeless shelter in the Catholic church rectory. And the last time I heard an update, they had had 14 families live in the rectory. So that they are attempting to address the issue and they are very committed to it. Um, the other part that I wanted to share with you about it was in the post-tour discussion, we went around the room and everybody talked about their, their impressions from the tour. And toward the end of the discussion, um, a member of the, the Parks Commission spoke up and talked about how he had been on the Parks Commission for 40 years and how thrilled he was at this point to see that the city has a vision all the way out to 2040. Uh, the 2040, the date 2040 came up a lot during the tour and he was thrilled that they were looking ahead that far. So for somebody who I'm guessing he's in his 70s or 80s, for somebody at that age, it just felt really, really good to know the city that he had poured his heart into as it related to the parks was, was looking ahead that far. Okay, thank you for sharing, Council Member. Further discussion on Council Member Vento's motion? Discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Larson, for your report and for your work on this. Our sixth business item, 2019-274, another joint committee's item. It's the City of Columbus 2040 Comprehensive Plan, <coughs> Comprehensive Sewer Plan. With Mr. Riley, welcome. Thank you, Chair Lilligren. I am uh, Jake Riley, Senior Planner for the Local Planning Assistance Group and Community Development. And today I'm also here to present uh, just one section up and to the left, as it were, on your map, the City of Columbus um, Comprehensive Plan. And I'd like to let the committee know that the City Administrator, Elizabeth Mursko, is in the audience along with the Mayor, um, Jesse Preiner, and Council Member, Janet Hagland. So thank you um, for like being here. Thank them for Thanks being so here. And for your work and the work that they did as well as that of uh, Highland Mays and the staff at Bolton and Nick. Thank you, Mr. Riley. So for uh, the city of Columbus with the regional systems, and I'm sorry, I'm recovering from a cold, so I apologize, if, uh, I'm a little stuffy. Um, a map shows the regional systems components within the city of Columbus. Of note is the Rice Creek Chain of Lakes Regional Park in the southeast corner of the city near also Interstate 35. Um, and the city appropriately acknowledges state lands in terms of the Carlos Avery Wildlife Management Area, which is those are those large green blocks um, on the west and north, um, which is a apparently a popular hunting and wildlife observation area. It looks beautiful. I would really like to go there, actually. Um, that covers 25,000 acres, um, which is a big, big area. Um, the community designation. Uh, for the city of Columbus is a combination of diversified rural with a small southeastern part of the city designated as emerging suburban edge. And Columbus is located in east central Anoka County, surrounded by the communities of Linwood Township, Wyoming, Forest Lake, Hugo, Lionel Lakes, Blaine, Ham Lake, and East Bethel. Uh, the city's forecasted growth, which is on table one in your staff report as well as on the slide, um, shows that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts the city will grow by uh, about uh, 1,300 people, representing 600 households, and there will be an increase of 300 jobs in the same time frame. Table two, also from the staff report shown here, um, illustrates the planned residential density in the emerging suburban edge areas of the city. Um, those are the areas being planned for sewer growth, um, and the overall density for guided residential land is expected to be um, in this area between 12.1 and 22.4 units per acre. Um, Communities with, uh, in this area are anticipated to be in two new mixed use residential categories, which we'll discuss when we get to the future land use map. Um, the diversified rural portion of the city is um, needs to plan for growth, not to exceed forecast and in patterns that do not exceed four units per 40 acres. And the um, plan does guide land in that. So here's the land use map. Uh, also figure three in your staff report. It's primarily open space in the city of Columbus with much of the north and western portions of the city covered by the Carlos Avery Wildlife Management Area. Um, and the remaining areas are a mix of rural residential, residential and suburban residential developments. Um, two areas near the two major thoroughfares, Interstate 35 and Lake Drive, have commercial and industrial uses. 
Um, and here on the future land use map, you can see that they've um, planned to intensify uh, uses in those same areas um, with much of the rest of the city's land use uh, remaining the same through the 2040 horizon. Um, so those, the purple and red and areas on this map are staged for additional mixed use residential and some commercial development and redevelopment, which is how they achieve those densities. So the proposed findings today for the City of Columbus 2040 plan is that it conforms <coughs> to metropolitan system plans, is consistent with council policies, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. Um, like some of the other communities, this will go to the Environment Committee tomorrow and then the Metropolitan Council on Wednesday, October 23rd. Um, and to remind you that the uh, <coughs> City of Columbus staff um, and council members and mayor are in the audience. If you have any specific questions, direct to them. So with that, the proposed action before you today is to authorize the City of Columbus to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect, advise the city to implement the advisory comments and the review record for transportation, wastewater, surface water management, and land use. And that completes my report. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Riley and Mayor Prenner, Councilmember Hegland. Thanks for being here. And Ms. Mershko as well, Mershko as well thanks. Uh, any questions on that report? Questions? I entertain a motion, Councilmember Vento. It seems to be your district's day <laughs> today. Congratulations. I move approval, and as soon as there's a second, I'd like to. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Vento. The, the mayor and the city council member and the administrator's presence here today shows you the commitment they have to their city and the enthusiasm that they had. Um, I, I met them. Um, at an Anoka County meeting in May, I think it was the end of May, and the minute I met them, I knew I was going to enjoy getting to know them more and their city more, and they invited me to come up um, for a city tour and to um, attend a, a, an economic development committee meeting, and I learned so much in those few hours that, that I spent there, but uh, it's an amazing amazing community. I admitted to them then, and I've told this story more than once, that a number of years ago I was driving back from Duluth and I saw this sign for Columbus and I, it hit me like, Columbus? I didn't know there was a Columbus, Minnesota. And if being on the council and, and in particular representing District 11 has taught me anything, it's to take the exit and to go visit these communities and to not let what you see from a highway or a freeway be your first and only impression. It's when you take the exit and you get into those communities that you really get to know more about them. And Columbus is a perfect example of that. They've got a lot of exciting plans going on there. They're um, working on a, a beautiful new apartment complex near what will be their new exit off of 35. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I believe, closed now for the month, correct? The exits? Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Um, but um, they've, they've got a beautiful new hotel going in, and I think there's going to be a new grocery store, too, and a number of other developments. So they've got a lot of really great things going on in Columbus. And I would encourage you all to, to visit there because it's, it's just a tremendous city with a lot of energy. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, further discussion on the motion? You know, again, with thanks for our visitors. I agree with Council Member Bento. It really shows an incredible commitment <coughs> to your community. Uh, all in support of Council Member Bento's motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Riley. I hope you get over your cold. You sounded Thank you. fine, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to our seventh business item, 2019-266. It's a future reimbursement consideration for Carver County on the Highway 5 Regional Trail. And Ms. Lee, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm a senior parks planner at the council. And I'm here today to present a future reimbursement consideration for Car Carver County Highway 5 Regional Trail. As a reminder, future reimbursement consideration is a tool that agencies may use to access their share of a future regional bonding allocation. The agency must request future reimbursement consideration to the council prior to any work being initiated. If the council approves the request, then the agency may begin construction, pay the expenses with their own funds, and then be eligible for later reimbursement with council bonds made from their share of a future regional bonding allocation. 
In front of us today is a request from Carver County to use this tool to facil facilitate the development of the Highway 5 Regional Trail. The Highway 5 Regional Trail is located in Carver County between Victoria and Chanhassen. The master plan for the Highway 5 Regional Trail was approved in June of 2018. This map shows the approved nine mile trail corridor in red and existing regional trails in blue. The Highway 5 Regional Trail connects to the Lake Minnetonka LRT Regional Trail in Victoria, then travels east through Chanhassen to existing connections for the Minnesota River Bluffs Regional Trail. Most, most of the trail corridor utilizes existing sidewalks and trails. However, there is no current infrastructure for the trail through the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. The Arboretum has graciously agreed to allow the county to build the trail on their property out of and away from the highway right of way. The county wants to start construction this fall on part of this segment, specifically from Lake Minnewashta Parkway east to Century Boulevard, which is shown circled in purple. In addition, they want to build an underpass at Highway 41, which is indicated with a star. This underpass was identified during the public engagement process as a high priority safety need. Approval of this future reimbursement consideration will allow Carver County to begin work on this project right away. And with that, our proposed, proposed action is to consider reimbursing Carver County up to $1 million from its share of a future regional parks bonding program for costs it incurs for the development of a two mile segment of the Highway 5 Regional Trail located between Lake Minnewashta Parkway and Century Boulevard in Chanhassen and inform Carver County that the council does not under any circumstance represent or guarantee that it will reimburse the county and that expenditures of local funds never entitles a park agency to reimbursement. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Questions on that report? Any questions? Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how many years will, the whole, will it take to finish the whole trail? Ms. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, thank you for the question. <coughs> I think most of the trail is using existing sidewalks and trails, um, but there are plans to uh, further develop those segments to make them compliant with the regional policy plan and ADA and all of that. So I'm not sure in the timeline for how long it'll take to bring all of those existing connections up, um, but I can get back to you with specific dates. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions on Ms. Lee's report? Any questions? Seeing none, Ms. Lee proposes a series of actions relative to the consideration of reimbursing Carver County up to a million dollars from its share of future regional parks bonding program. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval. Thank you, Council Member. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thanks. Discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thanks, Ms. Lee, Thank for your work on this and for your report. Committee members all note that the next two business items, eight and nine, have no presentations attached to them. Then we will move into the item 2019-259, the 2019 Unified Budget Amendment, third quarter, with Ms. Agassin Neubner. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, my name is Heather August Huebner. I'm the finance director for community development and MTS. And you've heard me say this for a few quarters now, but the budget amendments are a routine part of our annual budgeting process. And we come to you approximately quarterly to make adjustments to both our operating and capital budgets. So I'm gonna preview some information from my capital budget presentation that will happen later tonight, just to get everybody settled in the terminology. So our capital program has three primary sections the Authorized Capital Program, or ACP, the Capital Budget, and the Capital Improvement Plan, or CIP. The ACP provides multi-year authorization to spend on project costs where the funding has been secured and the Council has given final approval to proceed. The Capital Budget represents the amount of the ACP expected to be expended in a given calendar year, and the CIP is a six-year capital investment plan. The CIP is approved by the Council through our annual budgeting process. Projects in the CIP have funding sources identified but not yet secured and the Council has not yet given final approval. Projects are added, removed, and changed through the Council's amendment process and that's why I'm here before you today. 
So specifically today, we propose to bring in $300,000 in regional bonds to fund the equity grant pr program pilot. This amount reflects the amount approved in the equity grant program fund distribution plan the council approved in June of 2019. Funds will be awarded to projects selected through a competitive solicitation. A review team will score the proposals and make recommendations for funding to MPOSC, the Community Development Committee, and the full council. Grant agreements will be executed once the solicitation process is complete. I'd also like to note this amendment includes a number of administrative adjustments. These represent projects where funding has already been approved in the ACP and is now being adjusted to a specific project. So if you'll remember in Q2, we brought in legacy dollars and we brought it in an undesignated or unallocated uh, line items for particular project for particular parks implementing agencies. Those agencies have now defined those specific projects and that's what you'll see before you as uh, administrative adjustments. This amendment supports the thrive outcome of stewardship through responsible planning and management of resources for the community development division and regional park system. It also addresses livability by providing access to natural resources for healthy exercise. All projects in this business item have been reviewed for conformity with the regional parks policy plan and are in approved parks and trails master plans. I'd be and our proposed action is that you authorize the 2019 unified budget as indicated and in accordance with the attached tables. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Augustin Hubner. Am I getting it? Am I getting closer on your name? <laughs> <laughs> Thank You're doing you. great. <laughs> questions on that report? Any questions? The proposed action is that the Met Council authorize the 2019 Unified Budget Amendment as indicated and in accordance with the uh, tables attached to the report. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, any discussion on that motion? This, yep. Um, Council Member Chambliss. On the authorized new grants increase, authorized funding, reduce authorized funding, am I in the right section? Um, it's a new amount for equity grant funds. Mm -hmm. um, you have 300000 and then there's a proposed document that's attached here. I see that in 2022, uh, the amounts, actually the amounts start increasing 2020, 2021, and then um, it starts going up more significantly in 2022. Can you uh, remind us why that is? I under, I remember hearing that um, the amounts for the equity grant program council bonds could be between three hundred thousand and five hundred thousand. Ms. August Huber. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members. So I'm happy to answer the question, but that the attachment that you're looking at is actually the for item. the budget presentation oh, okay. that I'm going to be doing in a minute or two. Okay. So, so. One, you're absolutely right. We'll, we'll talk about that in the next presentation. Um, if if that answer is dependent upon your approval of the budget amendment, or if you would like, I'm happy to answer it now, too. Well, that's part of why I'm asking. Sure, please, if you would. Sure, sure. so Mr. Chair, committee members. So when you're looking, let's just do me a favor. If you're looking at the the attachment that you're referencing, which will be connected to the capital budget presentation from later tonight, in the fund distribution plan, we we talked about there's money in there, and I, I'm forgetting the words verbatim, but basically we know that we had money for 2019, which is the 300,000 we're asking to bring in now. There's also money budgeted in 2020. And the option in the fund distribution plan was from this, this current slate of projects to potentially bring money in from the 2020 CIP, should that be the recommendation and decision from this pilot solicitation. Okay, thank did, you. Did that answer the question? Thank you, Council Member. Further discussion on the motion? Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It, um, it feels really cumbersome to do this unallocated thing and then allocate it the next time. Are we going to be doing that all the time or can we get them just once in the future for the all of that transition stuff that we, is in this item? Thank you, Ms. Augustine-Huber. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, we have a 
we have a couple options. Um, the council did make a decision under the last council to bring in money in these undesignated or, un or um, unallocated amounts. So the option that I could offer to the Community Development Committee now is all of these administrative adjustments, we're sharing those with you for transparency's sake. Mm -hmm. You're not officially adopting or authorizing those. So if it's the preference of this committee, we could we could not list them. That that would be an option I could offer to the committee now. Anything over and above that, I believe, would be a broader conversation. Councilmember Wolf, then Councilmember Chambliss. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I prefer to have the transparency of seeing where the money goes. <clears throat> I just don't really see the point of doing the unallocated and then coming back a quarter later and allocating it because it doesn't seem. Did did anybody? W would anybody have not been able to get their money in a timely manner if we did it all at once? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, committee members, there have been times, yes. So, I mean, there, there's times when the council doesn't have a budget amendment for five or six months, and if money gets brought in, then whether they be implementing agencies or suburban transit providers on the transit side, they essentially can't get their money and because of our administrative processes. So this was one, um, one way that we tried to speed up our processes a handful of years ago to make sure that we were passing through the funds as quickly as we absolutely could. But other, otherwise, if, if we don't bring them in until there's a project identified, we could potentially be putting projects behind anywhere from a month to up to six months under the worst case scenario. Which is probably something we don't want. Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, I mean, I understand the transit stuff works a little differently because things can get shifted around. But with the park stuff, typically they identify their projects well in advance. I, I, I guess I don't quite see the reasoning or why we need to have two processes. Ms. Oxenberg, do you, do you happen to know how many projects may have been, whose schedules had, may have been put at jeopardy or delayed because of, because they were un, unable to receive their funds? Is there a way of gauging this? Um, Mr. Chair, Council Members, anecdotally I can give you an answer. To give you a clearer answer, I might want to take that back and get back to you if that would be an option acceptable to the committee. I think that would be good to have some more data. I mean, if we are going to hold up projects, that's something we would want to avoid. So if you could, please, and then we can discuss this at the next Community Development Committee meeting. So Thank you. Yeah, please. And Mr. Chair, if I, if I may add, add something. One of, one of the meetings that we had with Parks Implementing Agencies a handful of months ago was to really have a conversation with them about processes and procedures and what was most important to them. I think it's, I'm pretty confident saying towards the very, very top of their list was doing anything we could to improve their processes, um, or improve our processes to make sure that we're getting the money through as fast as we possibly can. So let me, let me do a little bit of digging and see if I can actually come back with a tangible number. My sense is I'm not going to be saying exactly X number, but I'll be able to put a little bit more. Um, context. A little more context behind Perfect. it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Acceptable? Well, thank you. For the discussion on the motion, Councilmember Chambliss. Oh, I just wanted to remind you uh, that I uh, wanted to speak on this, and um, at any rate, I accept Please. your explanation. So ah, I thank you. That's right. I had you in queue. Thank you. <laughs> well, further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in approval. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, August Newgren. Our ninth and final business item tonight is 2019-275 to establish a public hearing for Livable Communities Act uh, Affordable and Life Cycle Housing Goals for uh, 2011 through 2020. Mr. Burns, thanks for being here. Thank you, here. Mr. Chair, committee members. Every year, oh, I'm Paul Burns, manager of the Livable Communities Programs. Um, every year, communities that are not already participating in the Livable Communities Act programs have the opportunity to join and, and choose to belong. And in order to do that, they need to pass a resolution accepting affordable and life cycle housing goals and get that resolution to us by November 15th of any, any given year. The council then is required by law to hold a public hearing and adopt, readopt all of the participating communities uh, housing goals by January 15th of that next year. So in order to get the uh, required public notice, 
uh, period in, we're, we're asking that the council order a public hearing for uh, the December 16th Community Development Committee meeting. So uh, the recommended action is that the Metropolitan Council conduct a public hearing on December 16th, 2019 at 4 p.m. in the Metropolitan Council Chambers to receive comment on the Local Communities Act Local Housing Incentives Account Affordable and Life Cycle Housing Goals for 2011 to 2020 adopted by any community electing to participate in the LCA by November 15th, 2019. Thank you, Mr. Burns. So Mr. Burns has proposed the action of setting this public hearing for December 16th, 2019 at 4 p.m. here in the chambers. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank Second. You. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? Discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Burns. We'll see you on uh, December 16th, if not before. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll move on to our information items, committee members. The first is our Land Use Advisory Committee report. Uh, Land Use Advisory Committee is chaired by Councilmember Wolf, and I believe you'll be giving the report, correct? Um, well, Deb and I together. If okay, we can. great. That's so, Ms. Dietrich. Dietrich. <clears throat> Dietrich. Ms. Dietrich, welcome. Councilmember Wolf, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, the, the Land Use Advisory Committee uh, is statutorily required um, to be a part of the council, and it is also required to have more than half elected officials. Every four years, as we have a new council, we appoint a new Land Use Advisory Council committee and Judy Johnson and Peter Lindstrom and I were on the committee that interviewed applicants and rec made recommendations and the full council then approved those recommendations. We have more than half elected officials this time because in the previous committee somebody lost their election and then they couldn't be there anymore because we didn't have more than more elected officials <clears> than <throat> civilian members of the committee. We did try to get a broad, uh, a broad group of interests and, and abilities so that people could, could bring a lot of information to the council. So the first meeting we appointed the vice chair and I chose Phil Klein who is a city council member and Hugo as the vice chair. He has been on that committee for some time and, and um, also serves on the MOSAC group with me, the Metropolitan Area Water Supply Advisory Committee. So mm -hmm. we, we work together on, on a couple of things and there is some overlap between what MOSAC does and what LUAC does. So he seemed like a natural <clears throat> choice for that. So we did orientation for everybody and uh, got let, let everybody talk and get to know each other, with, find out a little about each other's backgrounds. And then uh, they had an overview of the Metropolitan Land Planning Act, comprehensive plans, and elevating affordable home ownership strategies. There was a lot of talk about, I can't remember what they're called, the, the, where the land is owned by the- Trust? trust. Yes, the trust, yeah, we had, had a, a long discussion about trusts and um, it's been a good group. They've been very interactive and, and contributing. It, previously, there was a lot in the LUAC meetings where inter, information was just being presented to them and we're trying to make it more interactive and pull knowledge from them as well to better understand what's going on in the communities. Unfortunately, at the next meeting, we had our retreat the same day, so I was not able to be there. Uh -huh. So Phil had to jump in immediately as the vice chair and run the meeting. And perhaps Deb can talk a little bit about what happened at that meeting since I wasn't there. Ms. Dietrich. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, um, at the July 18th meeting, um, we really had a uh, review of land policy in Thrive MSP 2040, um, which kind of laid out the 
a little background information and then walk through some of the actual policies in the different areas. So it was to especially be helpful to the 11 new members on the committee um, to ensure that they're, they're grounded in what our policies say when it comes to land use policy. Um, we also talked about the ongoing collaboration between the two committees that Council Member Wolf referenced. Um, this has been really going on since there was a joint uh, workshop of the two committees uh, not quite two years ago in November of 2017. And we're continuing to identify, uh, well, the committees during the workshop did identify shared areas of interest, and we talked about timelines for uh, really advancing work in collaboration with the committee members. And we did talk um, a fair amount about a, another planned workshop. So the intent was to make sure that uh, committee members were aware of the background for um, what had gone before and had a chance to ask questions and gain an understanding of what's coming up next. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Dietrich. So then on September 19th, we met again and got an overview on how things are going with the comprehensive plans um, and particularly an update on what was going on with economic competitiveness and resilience in comp plans. And there was a good discussion and some feedback about the process and how cities felt things were going with the comp plan process so far. There's been a lot of changes to how Ms. Baraha's uh, staff goes through the, the plans in, in response to things that were a little, you know, you learn lessons as, as you go. And so it's dramatically improved. <clears throat> and, and so there aren't the, the hiccups that they had initially with the, with the process. Um, the, the group also got an overview of what equity means in Thrive 2040. And then we followed that up with a, a discussion amongst the members on what equity means to them. Unfortunately, the other things in the in the uh, agenda, the local planning hi highlights, um, took up a little more time than we expected because there was such robust discussion. So we may have to come back at a future meeting and have some more discussion on, on how the, the members of the committee view equity and what things the council can do to help further that discussion. So that's what we've done so far. Are there any questions? Oh, thanks. I have a question, Council Member. So is this, is this the first time that you've uh, chaired the Land Use Advisory Committee or? Yes, it is. Okay. I was a member of the committee when I was a city council member. Oh, and then I had okay. to resign when I became a Metropolitan Council okay. member, just like I had to resign from TAB. And uh, John, John Commerce was the chair of LUAC for the eight years while he was on the Met Council. Okay. So then after he left, they said, hey, Wendy's done this before, let's put her there. <laughs> Thanks for your service. Mm -hmm. uh, questions on Council Member Wolf's report and Ms. Dietrich's report. Any further questions? Where do you see the Lindstrom? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Where do you see the committee going in the future? Well, one of the things that we're talking about for the future, there's some, some work going on to look at the livable communities programs. And if there's anything that comes up from that, that they want somebody to take a deep dive on, this would be a good group to run those sorts of things past. Absolutely. Further questions, Council Member Um, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I um, <clears throat> had a couple of conversations with the vice chair on Saturday at the Hugo City tour, and he spoke very highly of you as the chair of the committee. So well, thank you. I wanted <clears throat> you to know that, and I wanted the rest of us to know that as well. It was uh, an unsolicited compliment. It was a very <laughs> sincere one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. 
Councilmember Johnson. And just briefly, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank you too and the team that supports LUAC. Mm -hmm. And again, um, when we were making our appointments months ago to this group, it was really fun seeing all of the awesome applicants and uh, making sure that we had a robust and diverse group. And um, your leadership on that is greatly appreciated. And I know I've got representation certainly from District 1, and that member is enjoying it. And I think. Um, feedback has been great and your leadership's appreciated so thank you well great thank you yeah uh, thank you both for working council member thanks for your leadership on this sure uh no action on this item so thank you it was informational and we'll move on to our final information item it's community development division capital program and once again it's ms august and Hoover. thank you All right, thank you for having me back. I'm gonna give this just a minute to catch up. All right, so today we'll be walking through the Community Development Division Capital Program. We're gonna start broad about this, talk about the system a bit and then narrow down to talk about proposed changes from the current 2014 to 2024 CIP to the proposed 2020 to 2025 CIP. So as I mentioned earlier tonight, and you might be sick of me by saying this by now, our capital budget is a living, breathing document, and we're continually updating it through our budget amendment process. So today's presentation will be your first view of the division capital program whole cloth. There is time for additional conversation prior to December adoption of the council's final budget. So what I really tried to do with this presentation is to balance some context and some history and some systems with the actual program information and allocations. I may not have hit the right balance. So I guess I'm just gonna <laughs> offer up that if there are questions that are outstanding or information that you want presented in more detail or more background, just let me know. And I'm happy to do that either on a one-on-one -on -one basis or I'm, I'm happy to come back also. Thank you. Um, so I also wanna call out that there's a couple areas where ongoing conversations are gonna happen, but you're not gonna see represented in this budget presentation. One of those is parks interest earnings. That's parks interest earnings have been a conversation for a while. There's, uh, there's questions about do they go in the, are we gonna, <laughs> does the council <laughs> gonna wanna budget them in the operating budget or the capital budget? So we're gonna bring that conversation back to you after the first round of the equity grant program pilot has gone through and we've got some more lessons learned. So just know we haven't forgot about it. We're just gonna bring it back. The second item that you're not gonna see in here is we've talked a little bit about our HRL8 council owned housing and the asset management work there. We know that that's a project that the council members I think are gonna talk about at, at a budget re or at retreat where some budget conversations are coming up. So we're just putting that on hold, at, or I guess at a pause in our capital budget presentation right now, pending some additional council member conversations. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through all of these terms with you since I just did it um, at the budget presentation, but consider this your cheat sheet that if I use a term and you're like, oh, is that the capital program? Is that the CIP? Let me know. I'm gonna try and use language cues so you don't have to keep looking at it, but consider this your cheat sheet. Okay, we never have a parks presentation without giving ourselves the opportunity to say that we have a system of parks and regional trails that's nationally renowned for its beauty, size, and variety of features. Um, one of the fun things about the parks presentations is there's always a ton of great pictures to go with them, and it's just a nice snapshot of our region. Uh, with 56 regional parks and park reserves totaling more than 54,000 acres, nearly 400 miles of interconnected trails and eight special recreation features, the system provides a wealth of opportunities for recreation, exercise, and just plain fun. It also preserves um, significant green space and wildlife habitat. The regional park system had nearly 60 million visits in 2018. That's more than the Mall of America. Our system adds untold value to the livability and attractiveness of our communities. Okay, so there's a lot of players in the regional parks and open space system. This graphic and the next series of graphics will walk through at the really high level the role each plays in our capital program. 
So the state of Minnesota, Metropolitan Council, and parks implementing agencies are all impacted by a number of pressures. Those are gonna be those kind of outside arrows that you see. That includes legislative action, economic and environmental factors, and regional needs and outcomes. So let's take these piece by piece. So the state of Minnesota plays a number of roles. For the sake of today, let's focus at really that 100,000 foot level. At this level, state legislation created the Regional Parks and Open Space System. It defined the role and authority of the council within that system, and they appropriate funding. At the state agency and commission level, agencies and commissions helped to execute the legislation that was passed. They passed through funding and they execute competitive grant funding processes to award grant funding. Under state law, the council is charged with overseeing the acquisition and development of regional parks and trails. With broad public engagement, the council develops regional policy and standards and Thrive MSP 2040 and the Regional Parks Policy Plan. These plans address issues related to regional parks policies, plans, and grants. The Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission, or MPOSC, helps the council develop these long-range plans in an acquisition and development program that includes funding for the regional parks. We, we being the council and MPOSC, review parks and trails master plans for conformity with the regional policy, ensure all projects funded in our capital program and are, are in an approved master plan, and serve as fiscal agent to ensure funds are expended in line with various program and funding source requirements. The parks are operated by partnering cities, counties, and special districts, and each have their own governing boards. Implementing agencies lead regional park and master trail planning, including public engagement associated with that. They operate and work to acquire and develop land for regional parks and trails. They also protect and conserve natural resources and provide outdoor recreation for public enjoyment. Okay, so I played with a lot of graphics. This one isn't perfect, but I think it gets the general feeling across that all, there's a lot of processes that are interconnected in the regional parks capital project life cycle. So when you put this, like we put everything together, it looks a little bit of something like this. So let's start at about the one o'clock position. All projects funded through our capital program, except for legislative earmarks, align with Thrive, MSP, and Regional Parks Policy Plans adopted by the Council. These documents set the stage for project development at the regional level and are the Council's primary opportunity to set regional guidelines and engage with the public. These plans also lay out engagement standards for master for public engagement standards and a number of other standards for master planning work that happens at about the five o'clock position. So at about the five o'clock position, parks implementing agencies start to take the lead. They engage with the public to develop master plans and to develop specific, specific capital projects, which are prioritized and included in their agency CIP or capital improvement plans. The council also has capital improvement plans, and we develop our capital improvement plans at the program level. And I'll talk more about what that means on a future slide. So let's move about up to seven o'clock. Once funding has been secured, it's gonna be brought into the council's authorized capital program through a budget amendment. And at about the eight o'clock position, we're going to start passing that money through to the parks implementing agencies through grant agreements. All projects funded in the council's authorized capital program conform to the regional parks policy plan and are in an agency master plan. The cycle is rounded out through performance measurement, and that takes the form of a variety of reports and data submissions. So this is not linear. It keeps going. It's a living, breathing process. Projects get adjusted. They are rescoped. They are re-reviewed. I think the, the big thing to keep in mind is take a look at kind of, you know, that 12 o'clock through three o'clock position, that's what really sets the stage for any project that you're gonna see coming through our capital plan. So let's talk a little bit about revenue assumptions. We fund capital projects through four primary revenue sources. These include legacy, environment and natural resources trust fund, state of Minnesota bonds and council bonds. We do also get direct appropriations, commonly referred to as earmarks from the state. 
we don't plan for those. So just so you know, when I'm talking about the CIP, we don't plan for any earmarks in the CIP, but when and if the legislation appropriates them, we will bring them into the authorized capital program as they ask us to and we'll execute grant agreements there, but you're not gonna see anything in our plan related to earmarks. So we make revenue- more, a Question from Councilmember Wolf. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's more of a comment than a question that the earmarks in the past, the, the legislature has kind of seen that as part of the same pie. So if they do a lot of earmarks, there isn't much money that comes to us for to be distributed to the parks agencies. So it hasn't been 15 million a year, even though that's what we asked for 10 for we, even we've tried to get more than 10 to go with our mm -hmm. our match but it, it keeps getting chopped down most of the time because of all of the earmarks Works. makes sense thank you Ms. Anderson, you're here. okay so we make assumptions based upon what we feel are reasonable assumptions of funding that's going to come into the parks and open space system so I'm going to walk through them, but for those of you that like to get the big picture, I did hand out, uh, looks like an Excel spreadsheet that'll lay it out by year and by funding source. <clears throat> so legacy funds are appropriated by the legislature and we forecast this funding to increase by about 2% annually. Our 2020 base year is just over $20 million and we forecast annual funding will increase to just over 22 million by 2025. Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund dollars are awarded through a competitive grant process. We apply for funding in partnership with parks implementing agencies and the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources or LCCMR awards those grants. We anticipate a relatively stable funding at about $750,000 from ENRTF and about a half million dollar council bond match. Um, state of Minnesota bonds are appropriated by the legislature and some years we do well and some years it's a little more challenging as council mm -hmm. member Wolf indicated. Um, but the council has traditionally requested in the neighborhood of about $15 million in bonding years. And we have a policy to match $2 of council bonds for every $3 of ENRTF and state bonds. At any given time, we can have up to $40 million in regional parks bond outstanding. Okay, so 100% of uh, anticipated parks capital funds are passed through. And the, the programs that we pass them through are listed on this slide. The council administrators, administers regional parks grant programs and provides funds to expand, improve, and maintain the regional park system. As you can see on the graphic, three of our four grant programs are supported through state funds, several of which are distributed by formula. You can also see that the council provides a match in three of four of these programs and fully funds the equity grant program. And I'm gonna get back to more details of council member of your question in a couple slides. Uh, funds are passed through via grant agreements. We currently have a portfolio of over 260 open grants, totaling about $167 million. We anticipate awarding about $221 million in grant funds over the next six years. So let's put everything together and then we'll deconstruct again. So our parks capital program is $389 million. As a reminder, this includes our current authorized spending and our planned spending. Uses by department represents where the funding will go. We know that 100% of funds to be passed through, we know that 100% of funds are gonna be passed through and that, and that about $315 million will go to implementing agencies based on a funding formula. So those dollars are really representing the bond dollars and the legacy dollars. We also know that about another $40 million will also go to implementing agencies through the land acquisition pro process, a program, excuse me, and that's on a first come, first serve. The remaining $34 million represents legislative earmarks and or the equity grant program. So let's move to that second, the middle slide, uses by category. Based upon history, we anticipate that about 40% of the funds will be used in, to improve the existing parks and trails. About 36% will go to expand the system, and about 24% will be used to preserve the system. 
these percentages may adjust over time and based upon how implementing agencies prioritize their projects. The state funds about 84% of the capital program with the council providing the remaining 16%. I do wanna say the parks implementing agencies have their own funds in their capital program, so, but you're not gonna see their matches and their overmatches on, on any of the charts that you see before you. So this chart represents future spending. This consists of authorized projects with unspent, unspent balances and new plan projects. So basically, we had the $389 million. We spent a good chunk of that, and this is what's left. Again, authorized funds are passed through via grant agreements to park implementing agencies and communities identified by the legislature to receive direct appropriations. Future spending in our CIP represents planned projects to preserve, improve, and expand the system. And I'll provide some examples of specific projects on the next couple slides. Okay, so let's start to drill back down again. So we started the development of the CIP with the 2014 to 2024 CIP. So you're not gonna see changes there with the exception of one thing that I will call out for you. So this slide is really calling out the modifications. First, one of our major commitments is the council match. We're gonna to plan to continue, or the proposal <laughs> is to continue matching state of, Minnesota, so state of Minnesota appropriations as directed by statute or existing council policy. Our adjustments that you're gonna see on the right-hand column there is primarily adding the year 2025 to the CIP. We have programmed anticipated legacy, ENRTF, and council bond revenues and expenses to 2025. We also made a minor adjustment in how we propose ENR TF funds be programmed. We have programmed the same amount of revenue as the council historically has over the six year period. In past years, it was budgeted every other year. What we have done is taken that same amount of investment and flattened that out to an annual basis so that we can apply for ENRTF grants on an annual basis rather than putting ourselves on an every other year application basis. Mr. Chair. Councilmember Johnson. Quick, just so it, by going on an annual basis, is that just to be more timely in response to the CIP and implementing agencies? Ms. Alex Jupiter. Uh, Mr. Chair and Council Members, it, it's just, yes, it's really to just put us in a good position to apply on an annual basis. So we, when we have ENRTF grants, we, we get them through a competitive process and we don't ever know exactly how fast those funds are gonna be spent down and used by implementing agencies <clears throat> and by flattening out the dollar amounts to every other year. It just give, really gives us more flexibility of when we put our next application in. <coughs> so the council serves as a fiscal agent to distribute legacy and bond dollars in support of the Metropolitan Regional Park System. As a reminder, legacy funds are allocated to each park implementing agency in accordance with a formula set in state statute, and bond dollars are allocated to implementing agencies based on a formula in the regional parks policy plan. We have about $49 million remaining to spend on currently authorized projects and $190 million planned. Plan dollars are budgeted at the program level in this case by anticipated implementing agency share of state bonding and legacy dollars. And that's what you're gonna see in that map. So what we really took is the snapshot of the most recent data that we had and played that forward six years and how that allocation would happen amongst the different parks implementing agencies. As we get updated information every year, these, these numbers will shift a bit, but probably not materially, um, so we just, we needed a basis and the basis was the most recent snapshot of the data that we have available. So currently authorized projects include projects such as the new pavilion at Lake George Regional Park, multiple improvements to Whitetail Woods Regional Park and public outreach activities at multiple regional parks agencies. On the plan side for state fiscal year 20 and 21, we have over 50 proposed projects to maintain and improve the regional parks. So this is what council member, one of the examples of what council member Wolf was talking about earlier. In many cases, we know, or we are highly certain what a lot of those projects are gonna be. And the movement of those projects is really within the 
margin, but we as a general rule know what is coming down the pike. So nearly 60% of these projects have been specifically designed to impact equity in the regional park system through reducing barriers to participation across race, age, ability, income, ethnicity, and natural origin. Agency projects are identified and prioritized by local governing boards and the council's role is to ensure conformity with regional policy and that the projects are in approved master plans. Three examples of planned projects include the city of Bloomington is using a portion of their legacy funding to support a parks ambassador program, which like our ambassador program seeks to bring the regional park system to people who are not currently participating. The Three Rivers Park District is transforming the park formerly known as Coon Rapids Dam Regional Park into a redeveloped Mississippi River Greenway National Park, National, excuse me, Regional Park in <laughs> Brooklyn Park. And this innovative park won a national award for its community engagement activities and will help step visitors through developed areas to a more natural experience and access to the Mississippi River. City of Minneapolis, City of St. Paul is funding the Como Park Zoo and Conservancy Shuttle, which helps alleviate car congestion while complementing their legacy funding entryway improvements. This slide summarizes land acquisitions funding. We have about $8 million left to spend on authorized projects and plan on $29 million in new land acquisition projects. As we discussed earlier, land acquisition projects are funded through ENRTF, Parks and Trails Legacy Fund, and a council match. Two recently completed Parks Acquisition Opportunity Fund projects include the Blakely Bluffs Park Reserve in Scott County. This acquisition secured over 37 acres of hardwood forest along the Mississippi River. This park reserve is in the early stages of development and not yet open to the public. The Kingswood Special Recreation feature in the Three Rivers Parks District is a 16-acre acquisition securing 680 feet of shoreline on Little Long Lake, one of the most pristine lakes in the Seven County region. The other category represents direct appropriations from the legislature and a planned um, equity grant program. The map you see on the left is the Lakes Link Trail around White Bear Lake. Some portions of this trail are part of the regional trail network and others are local trails. The council is passing through funds to Ramsey County, Montemedi, White Bear Township, and the city of White Bear. As CDC members are aware, we're currently piloting our equity grant program and the first round of applications have been received. One, I'll circle back um, to a question from earlier tonight. And what we end up doing with the equity grant program is you're gonna notice that the on a lot of these other funding programs, it's linear. It's 2% or it's a flat dollar amount. What we do with the equity grant program is we really start with the assumption that the regional funding commitment for regional parks is gonna grow at about a 1% rate a year. And then we take out our required matches for state, state bonds and legacy. And that dollar amount is what we have carved out right now for the equity grant program. So you're gonna see some years you're gonna you're gonna see anywhere from a one to I think a 13% annual increase in the equity grant program. And most years it's around nine or 10%. And with that, I would be happy to stand for any questions you may have. Thank you for that report. Questions on the report? Council Member Chambliss. Yes, I know um, I'm just reviewing the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space um, Commission report related to this. And um, the reason for you know the um, three hundred thousand capital bonds for increased equitable, equitable use, I want to re. I, I mean, I, I trust that the committee and the commission are you know looking through this and have have well thought plans, and I'm probably a hundred percent in agreement with that. But I do do and I probably should speak to them but I really want to stress that it's really helpful to expose young people early to the benefits of nature and the enjoyment and the appreciation of nature and I would I'm hoping that the council comes up with some ideas in their plans on how to do that I mean when I was young I went to camp and that allowed me to have a comfort level and an appreciation of the outdoors and the trail and everything that goes with it. And it, 
it's there's so much beauty and so much to enjoy that it's it's hard to even express. You just have to you have to live it, you have to experience it. And I think the sooner that we do that, the more interest we're going to have by various communities and and in particular communities of color that may not have been exposed in the past. Thank you, Councilmember. Further discussion, Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can answer to that somewhat because I was the liaison to the Parks and Open Space Commission until recently. Um, they have had a lot of discussion about how to connect kids and the, the regional park agencies work with the school districts and with, uh, so they've not just field trips, but now they're starting to put together like little buses where they can take the park to the school to have you know even more interaction with the kids because you can't take kids out of school all the time to go on a field trip and so they they've been expanding their reach by bringing the the park programs to the school to get even more uh, exposure to the kids. Great. So well, thank you, thank you, council members. For the discussion, council member Bento. Um, I've been involved with the the nature sanctuary here adjacent to downtown St. Paul, and one of the things that they've done there is. Um, develop curriculum um, and they've used it based on the state standards so that when kids come to visit the sanctuary it's a learning experience that's in mesh with the state the state standards and it's age appropriate and I've had an opportunity to participate in a couple of those days and what you said Councilmember Chalice is absolutely true those kids get so fired up and a year ago last spring I was there on a very chilly May more or May afternoon with them. I think it was May. Anyway, um, there was a little boy who had seen a grasshopper for the first time in his life. Wow. Now, as somebody who probably saw grasshoppers at the age of two or three, and as a former elementary teacher, it was pretty emotional. He was just so thrilled to have seen one right up close and personal. So, you're right. It does make a difference. Thank you. Further discussion on the report? Further discussion. Seeing none is informational only, so there's no action. Thank you for the report. And thanks to everyone from Parks who's here today as well and for, for your work and your team's work. And seeing no business before, further business before this committee, we're adjourned. <laughs>